And wait. Just a second. Great. We're live. Sorry. Some like I had a bleep on the on the screen. So, <laughs> guys, welcome to Seven Tips and an open QA. Ask anything with Richard Millington. Richard, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing good. I mean, ask any, anything you like, but let's keep it to the community side. I don't want to be yeah, that yeah, open yeah. about everything going on in my life at this point, but yeah. Um, so yeah, ask me anything. We're totally about the Q&A around uh, Rich's new book. And I was super excited when I saw, um, yeah, show to us. we saw the bit of it, saw the full book. Oh, you want the full book? Yeah, I don't yeah, know I, how to reverse the um, cam camera. There's like a technique no, to no, doing no. it, right? We can we, reverse we it. See it. We see it not reversed. Really? Yeah. Huh, interesting. It's super, it works. So um, we're on AirMeet. And if you don't know, it's an amazing uh, platform that's been around for a few years. And actually, we have a client in Norway. And they told us about it. And we brought it to our last Air, um, ISCL summit. And it was a blast. This is the meetup version. And now that you were all in the lounge, we're all here in the session, and we're going to have a great time <laughs> with Richard. And I also want to uh, thank Hey Expert, and another amazing platform that will send you a link in the end. Um, but I think uh, the best thing to do is just enjoy our quality time with Richard. Um, Richard, I don't think you need any more introductions because we wrote it everywhere. He worked with almost 300 companies from around the globe, uh, the best top companies in the world. Uh, Google, Apple, and many others. Actually, my favorite one is SAP because Richard gave, yeah. about, gave a, a, a brilliant lecture uh, two, three years ago in CMX Summit about uh, impact communities, about the, the, the true believers. And I always use the insights from that talk. And I think <laughs> Richard is, um, might be not the most veteran person in the community sphere, um, but he's for sure one of the most innovative and most clear thought leaders that takes <laughs> i'm sorry man it's just true it's just true and i'm sorry to i make appreciate it. it um and listen i don't know besides john bacon who has six books but only two of them are in community and um, i don't know any other professional in the community uh, world that has three books now just on the subject of building digital communities and um, which brings me to ask why a third book what's new about the book what made you Right, another one in, in such a short time. When, when was your first book published? Uh, the first book was 2012, I think. Yeah, I did Buzzing Communities in 2012. Um, why this book? Um, I could say I just had too much time to kill. Um, I think, you know, the pandemic hits and maybe that was a factor. Um, in honesty, I wrote the new book because I, I'm tired of how many or how much outdated advice and practices that are being used that are ending up developing communities that are misaligned with what members want. They're on the wrong platforms. They're not achieving the goals that they need. And a lot of the techniques and the belief systems we have around communities are completely out of date. Um, I wish they weren't, but, and I keep attending talks and events and I find that a lot of the information is vague and it boils down to be nice to members, create content and discussions, have a top member program and your community will thrive. And the reality is that often isn't true. The reality is we don't understand the psychology of members anywhere near enough as we need to. Uh, we don't understand how to design and set up the technology anywhere as near as well as what we need to. And we can be very successful in, say, Facebook groups at times. We can be very successful on some other platforms, and sometimes we might get lucky. But I think what this book tries to be is a series of best practices that apply very broadly across many different kinds of communities that are modern, that are up-to-date, that are in line with, in my opinion, how communities actually work today, which is very different from, I think, how a lot of people perceive of um, or conceive of um, com communities today. So that's... First of all, I agree with everything you said, and I think you know. Also, the, the, the advance of technology requires us to have a more in-depth understanding of the abilities and technologies, and that's a big part of what we're going to talk today about platforms, about how to use platforms, how to choose platform, which is, I think is a big part of the advice that people need today. But also, I just want the best and newest tips uh, that you think that your books provide. So, without any further ado, let's start with the first tip you think we should, uh, you, should you want to give the crowd here. <laughs> and we'll keep it short 
and and uh, and then uh, we'll have also a time for Q and A. On every tip, I'll add a few things, and we can move forward. And also, uh, Richard, if you feel we want to go, that I'll lead the questions that we prepared. We can go in that way. But I thought the best way um, is really to give you the the to choose the top tips out of what we discussed before. Well, let me start with um, what I think is the biggest and perhaps the most controversial one, or the one where I feel misaligned with a lot of other people in this space, which is why do people join communities? Why do people participate in, in online communities, especially brand communities? Now here, I'm not talking about personal communities in your life. I'm not talking about the close groups that you have with your friends and colleagues. Obviously, that's something different. But I've done survey after survey after survey. I must have had you know, hundreds of thousands of survey responses. I've interviewed thousands of prospective members in the community. Every project I in do interview after interview after, in after interview. And what I find is that people don't join a brand community for a sense of belonging. They just don't. There are one or two ex exceptions to that, I will admit. But generally speaking, they don't. What they join a community for is information access to information they don't already have. And that means that the quality of information in a community has to be good and it has to be delivered in a more convenient way than any other channel. And by convenience, we're talking about less effort, we're talking about speed of response, or simply sometimes it's easier just to write a message, post it in a community, go have lunch. When you come back, there's answers there instead of sitting on a customer support line or taking any other approach to that. And I think there's a widespread misunderstanding, perhaps by the notion and term community, that every community has to create this incredible sense of belonging and, and that's how a community succeeds. And it's great when it happens, but unless you've got data that says this is what members want beyond anything else, what I found is that that isn't the case. What I found that sense of belonging, friendships, connections, usually ranks last. And when it does develop, it usually develops as a consequence of having a high level of trust in the expertise and the um, um, notability of other members in that community. So if you want a community up and running today, the challenge is to make it more convenient than an existing channel. Don't try and change the behavior massively. If you're trying to create a new behavior from scratch for an audience that isn't really doing that behavior, that's going to be difficult. That's why, for example, most successful brand communities are communities that have redirected um, questions from customer support to a community because a community could do it better, cheaper, faster. Um, that's where most successful brand communities are. Um, there are other examples as well, but it's very difficult for a brand to build a genuine sense of belonging in a community today. And really, if you're trying to do that, you're probably going to struggle. It's a lot better to get smart people in a community, sharing information and getting immediate gratification from that community. If you get that thing in place, it's a lot easier to make the rest of your community thrive. But at the moment, I think what we think this um, discipline is, isn't actually what this discipline is. I think there's a misconception there. That's super important and I love that tip. Um, I have my own model of myself called the utility model, but we're not gonna talk about it now. <laughs> Second tip. What's your second tip about communities? Um, I think the second tip would be how we get a community up and running. And, and I think there's two ways that tend to work extreme, extremely well. The first way is where you have a big audience and you can redirect traffic from one channel to another. So this is where you put the community in the flow of where members already visit today. So if people are contacting customer support, if you put the community before customer support as a message, as an option, if you make it a bit higher above any other channel, if you integrate it with the product, if you integrate it in the uh, with the um, search bar, with cognitive search, if you do all these things, then you're going to get a lot of traffic to that community naturally. If you don't have a big existing audience you can work from, if you don't have a mailing list of, of around, it varies, but around 15,000 people seems to be the, the uh, sweet spot here, then you've got to build a community from, from scratch. And that usually means that the message is this community is exclusive. It's private. It's a community that only the best people get to join. And that also means the people building that community have to be a one of that group. You can't have someone junior trying to build a community for a very seen exclusive group. It doesn't work. They suss that out very quickly. So the people building that community have to be very smart, very knowledgeable. I've had like a couple of clients today um, or this, this year where two of them were really successful. They got the right community 
manager in and that community manager already had existing connections in that industry they've been working that industry for a long time they can invite the people they knew to join that community and get it up and running the third one was where the community manager didn't was quite junior hadn't really worked in in that sector before and just couldn't really connect in a authentic way and so i think you've got to figure out which path you're going if you want to get going really quickly you have a big audience and you can just redirect existing traffic if you're trying to build a new community from scratch, you need someone with a high level of credibility with that audience. You need to make it exclusive and you need to make sure it is exclusive. That means you can't let ev everyone join. It means first you have to reach out to people individually. You have to give them a personal invitation at the most senior level. It has to be very personalized. You have to give them specific things to do. You have to make sure that it offers them something they can't get from anywhere else, which means you have to be aware of existing groups. Uh, we're doing this with um, US Pharmacopia at the moment. Um, and again, it's very exclusive, very private. We do, we're building it on the discourse pl pl platform today. Um, but because we're focusing on those things and we've got the right person in place, it takes off and it's um, it's reached that critical mass phase already. So you have to decide which pathway to grow from you're going to take. Um, and I think if you get stuck in the middle, if you try to make it private without it being exclusive, if you try to make it private without the right person running it, if you try to have a um, big launch, but you don't re redirect enough traffic, you're going to struggle. Um, and I think you've got to really figure out where where those sources of growth are going to come from. I love it. And this also takes away in what you said, the fluff advice about you have to have a core, or you have to have, <laughs> you have to have, you call, you have to have your top marketeers. And that's, I think, a way, and we do it many times, we call it the core team, and the core mm -hmm. team has to be exclusive. You're, but you need to start from that. And again, I think that's the biggest mistake when people say, oh, community manager, he's just somebody that's going to just facilitate talks and, you know, write comments, <laughs> say hello, and, and approve members, and then they usually hire somebody that's in junior level. And a community, because it's such an amplifying role, something that you should invest in, something that's really good. Um, can I try and ask a tip from you and, and surprise you? Sure. So you help a lot of customers. I think you're one of the people that has a biggest range of companies you work with. So where do you find, how do you help them find those community managers? <laughs> um, I don't have a tip that'd be useful for most people, I don't think. But um, I learned something from a, um, a while ago. We were working with uh, Facebook on their community. And I remember working with uh, Phoebe Ven Venkat, fantastic woman. She, I worked for her Opto. I think she's gone to Trip Actions now. Absolutely fan fantastic at what she does. And she used to have this phrase that she would be building pipe, which is she is ma managing a team but she knows that she needs to get and source re recruits a year or two in advance. And that always struck me is that she was always attending like the meetup. She was always attending the event. She was always going, reaching out, having coffees with people, not because she wanted something immediately, but whenever there was a job opening, she would have close connections with people that trusted her to uh, join that community today. Even just with this week with Source Day Community Man Manager for one of my clients, simply by um, having that pipeline in place. So for me, um, and I don't want to turn into like a bragging thing, but I spend, or I used to spend before the pandemic, a huge amount of time on the road. So when I go to meet a client, I'd always try and meet as many other people in that region as possible. For a couple of years, I was working with a client in, um, well, yeah, I was working with a client in Las Vegas. And if I'm in Las Vegas, I know that San Francisco and um, Los Angeles and San Diego aren't that far away. So if so I'm flying there, I'd also spend a day in one of these places and meet with as many people as possible. I go to my MailChimp list, I'd segment and see who was in that location. I'd have my assistant reach out to them individually. And nothing might come of, say, 70% of them, but it also means I've got a good number of connections in that space. So when a job does, does arrive, I have a good idea of who might be a good fit for it, what kind of salary they're looking for, what kind of opportunity they're looking for. So for me, that's been the best possible thing. Um, I think if you're an organization without those contacts today, it would really be useful just to start meeting people, attending to events, looking at what's going on in the broader space, attending meetups like or events like this, online events, offline events, hosting your own thing. I think the more connections you have, the better you get to know them. Um, I think that's what's going to help the most. Love that tip. And by the way, I think that's one of the reasons that a company should open a community. I think <laughs> no, because a community yeah, I agree. Is a network and you can see how people interact. And if you see people, that are givers, contributors in, within the community, you don't need to network personally. You can see them active. 
And many times, I always talk, there's a difference between a network and a community, but you need to start as a network before you become a communal community. So I think mm -hmm. one, like one, one more thing I drew from that is that very often when we're recruiting someone, we're not entirely sure what skills we want for that role. So sometimes if you're launching a new community from scratch and you're hiring someone that has never built a new community from, from, from scratch, they might have very different expectations. The biggest mistake I see is an organization is launching a brand new online community and they get someone very senior that's worked with a very large um, com com community in the past to get it up and running. But they've only lived in an environment where members flock to them because they might have customer support questions or those kind of questions. They've never had to um, toil in the soil, as we'll say. They've never had to really grind to get every member to join and participate and fight for every member. And that's a completely different environment. It's completely different when you're building those, those initial connections where you don't have the right budget, you don't have the right support, but you're going to gradually learn to work better with uh, customer success and customer support teams. Like Very few people have the passion and the enthusiasm and dedication for that. And sometimes we think just because someone has a lot of experience in X, they're going to be very good at building a new community. And that doesn't always work. You've got to figure out who's going to be on the ground. Do they like working in the trenches? Do they like reaching out to every member? Do they like building those relationships? I mean, Jen, who is here um, today, is fantastic at this. I worked with her at, at, Geo, at, Geo, at Geotab for a while. Fantastic at doing precisely this work. Um, but if we had hired someone you know, from a different kind of brand doing that, that would have been a terrible result. So um, yeah, try and be very clear about what kind of skills and expertise you need at that role. So if we're trying to make it into a tip, how would you uh, summarize uh, how to choose your community manager for your next uh, community venture? Figure out what skills you actually need and recruit someone that has clearly done them. Not someone that talks a, a good game. A lot of people could do that. But look at their community. Have they actually done the things that they said that they have done? Um, and so if you're launching someone, if you're launching a new community from scratch, you need someone that wants to work in the trenches and who enjoys doing that, helping each member. If you're looking to scale an existing community, you need someone that is very good at doing that. That's a completely different set, set, set of skills. And some people are fantastic at that. I think uh, Scott, who is on this uh, line today, like again, I think is fantastic at that given his uh, tr track record. So you need the right skills for the, um, for, for the right role. Okay, love it. And um, let's talk about platforms. We can talk platforms all day long. I get I, a lot of trouble. I know. By the way, I think trouble you when I talk about person, tech. <laughs> you, wanna, you were, I think, the first person now at Community Club have it too, that created uh, on your website a resource with all the different platforms that exist for community managers. Yeah, if you go to feverbeer.com slash community platforms. Um, and that's a little misleading. I didn't select all of the platforms because there's hundreds and hundreds of these. If you go to uh, Comsor, C-O-M-M-S-O-R, they have a much bigger list of platforms. Comsource? What we, Comsor. Um, ah, Comsor. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, no, no, um, that was a Comsor, by the way. That's why I said Comsor is Community Club today. Like, or yeah. Community Club is the version where you can find everything about communities and the resources. So it's, it's, it's tricky. But if you go into Comsor website, you'll find the Community Club, and there you can find the resources. Yeah. Um, sorry about that. So totally, and um, Comma Store is a growing, but because it's open source, Did, didn't you do it open source as well in your website? No, what I did was looked at what are the most common platforms that people actually use. So I ignored most of the niche, or as you say in the in the US, the niche, um, the niche um, players that are out there, and focus on the on the bigger platforms that come up in most of the RFPs that we were developing and creating and all those things, and comparing them. So people could begin actually comparing the feature set about all of the platforms they're most likely to use at the higher level. It doesn't cover like a lot of the smaller platforms and technologies. There's lots of niche players. But I focused on the top, I think, 12 or so, and really did a deep dive into the costs and the trade-offs, and so you can compare them um, side by side with each other on the features that matter to you. That's awesome. And um, so if we need to try and rank you know, top platforms today that you need <laughs> good for opening for building communities? Um, this is such an interesting question, not just because I'm sure that some vendor will watch this and will get annoyed by the answer I say, but it means how would you even go about ranking them? Like, what does top mean? 
Like, because I don't think there is a best vendor. I don't think there is a best platform. It's like saying, what is the best car? You know, how, how do you decide what's the best car? It depends what features you value in that car in the first place. And it's the same with platforms as well. And so there's some platforms that are great for like the budget buyer. You know, if you want something that looks like Facebook, but isn't Facebook, then you've got like Circle, you've got Tribe, you've got uh, High, uh, High Bright. They range from a few hundred dollars a year to a few thousand dollars a year. All of them are okay platforms. If you want to go up to the enterprise level, then you have to go up to um, platforms like Higher Logic and Vanilla, who um, Higher Logic just recently acquired uh, Vanilla. Um, you have to look at uh, well, Chorus and yeah. Salesforce. Um, mm -hmm. But then you're looking at a budget that can range from, say, 15 grand a year way up to a million or more a year, depending upon what the full scope of your platform is. And then you've got like um, Discourse as well, which is kind of like an open source, but also a hosted form that you can use, uh, which I've used for some clients. So there isn't a uh, best vendor. Um, there I'll, isn't try, a best, I'll, try, best I'll try to rephrase. What do you sure. think? What do you think makes a top community platform? <laughs> if, if that's able to... Yeah. Um, what makes a top platform? I think there's some things that make a platform good. I don't know what makes it a top platform. I think a good platform is one that is still developing at a rapid pace, that they have great support, that they can change things. And I think that, it, that, it, that the platform obviously has to function really well which is really vague, but I mean, every platform out there today has very significant pros and cons. So Chorus, for example, you know, is a great platform if you are doing a customer support based community. Honestly, they're a great platform. They do most of the things. At the same time, they charge a price that's, com that's you know, at that level. Um, and if you want to build a community for a small in, in a smaller environment, if you want to build a community based around, say, customer success, then Chorus might not be the best answer. Uh, Salesforce is a great platform if you want to integrate it with if you want to integrate the community with your existing database and what you're doing. It's great for seeing for single sign-on, but at the same time, it's a little bit slower. It's not as good for search. And it's as fiddly as hell to work with. And then you need to hire an implementation partner like Seven Summits or Griziti or one of those firms to get it up and running and connect in the right, the right way. And so there's no one best vendor. What I would say is there are certain features that are very important to get right and that are seem to be growing in importance each year. And also some features that are less popular each year. So member profiles are getting less popular every single year. Really? People... Yeah, because if you think about it, you care about your Twitter profile, you care about your Facebook profile, um, but I'm guessing you don't care about your profile on an More online life. community that you joined once, right? I mean, like, I mean, it, you just don't, There's, because you're not enough pe people going to see it, you're not going to curate it and adapt it, but at the same time, people spend a lot of time on profiles when they shouldn't do, honestly. Um, what else? Uh, game uh, Gamification isn't really that important at all. Um, it can have a small impact here and there, but the amount of time we spend on it, when you're giving away conversation starter bad badges, no one cares about a badge like that. You know, they just, they just don't. Um, um, so badges generally aren't that popular. Getting discussions right, making it easy to engage and participate, really looking at how people can share content really easily and making sure they can post that single sign-on process is quite important as well. I mean, if we take a common feature in a lot of them, so a lot of Salesforce-based communities. As a security protocol, they will automatically log people out after two weeks. Now, that seems like, from a security perspective, a good idea. From an experience pers per perspective, that's awful. It means you've got to remember your password all the time. You've got to log back in. And so there's trade-offs in every platform that you use. Um, so, so, so it's a challenge. Um, and there's lots of features there. I think. We don't spend enough time looking at how convenient the technology is to use. The technologies that are going to thrive are going to become more and more convenient. Um, and the more convenient we can make a, pl a platform to use, the better. Great, great tip. And so this is tip number six before we go to the questions. If you have any questions, start writing them now. And now I have a very <laughs> question that wasn't so much addressed in the book and, and I wanted to surprise you about. Monetization, sure. because that's what hay, hay experts do. Okay, and, and they try and take a lot about monetization, try to take communities that have already crowd, 
and have people following and they're already experts mm-hmm. in their field and and try to move them from a world of you know okay you're following me and you're listening and everything how do I do the monetization and and what would be a great feature most important to do that uh, twist for a community manager <laughs> um monetization is an interesting one because the organizations that I've worked with that seem to do that are generally you More association based or they um, do advertise use for like that we've done it a little bit on our community as well I think what most people do wrong is they create a private membership site they try to charge money for it and they don't realize that actually they're not building a community they're building a magazine subscription or an online magazine subscription where people come they pay for the content they put fresh content and over time they realize that they're not reading that content and they unsubscribe The organizations that do this extremely well are organizations like socialmedia.org in uh, Austin, I think. Oh, I think they're based in Austin, um, somewhere around that. You know, they, they, if you look at socialmedia.org today, you'll notice how private and how exclusive it is. They notice, you notice that they reject most of the people that try to join. That's a completely different thing. If you look at YPO, that's a completely different thing. So charging membership at that level for that sense of exclusivity and privacy that it gives you, I think that's a really good idea. I think if you're looking at a model where anyone that has a following can build their own or monetize that, then the sites that are doing that, I mean, um, uh, what was the new blogging one? My mind has gone dead. Um, Substack, was it? Um, I think that's the name. Um, easy to, mon- to mon- monetize that kind of community. Or if you want a completely curveball, there's the, own, the, own, the OnlyFans site. I mean, they've given everyone that works in the... Um, sex industry a place to monetize their following as well so I think there's models like that that are interesting I can't claim to be an expert in them though okay so if we want to try and, and, and give a topic that's also relevant uh, we talked about membership projections because we want to know how to grow and that's something you actually talk about in your book so give us one good tip about membership projections how do you create <laughs> great membership projects? so when people are launching a community they they um, They're terrible generally speaking at projecting or predicting how many members they're going to have in that community and they'll come up with a round number like 10,000 members within a year and when I try to dig into that number where it comes from someone at some point has just said yeah it's a high number it sounds right let's throw it up there as a goal and it means it's a complete waste of time because they have no idea if it's unrealistic what I try to do is look at what are similar sized organizations in the space doing and Um, and then try to figure out what are some good ratios that we can use. So the way I look at this is first I look at how many people are visiting their home page today and how many people are clicking on the tab. If we assume the community is going to live as a, nav- as a navigation tab on the home page, then we can estimate how much traffic they're likely to get from that. I look at how many people are on the mailing list. If we know that they have 15,000 people on the mailing list, we know that the click-through rate is around 1% for an email, they send 15 of these out a year or so, We can estimate how many people like to visit the community as a result of that um, if we know how many customer support um, questions they're getting a day or how how um, how many calls their customer success uh, reps get a day then we can use that and make an estimate actually I can share a link um, I think yeah, this will work. let me quickly share a link to what I use here and you can tweak this to however you like um, but we use a tool like this just to have a rough estimate of Of how much um, activity a, an, or a community is li- is likely to get and it's not exact honestly it's not exact the ratios might change with different organizations or be changes and all those things but the important thing is at least now you're basing it upon a defensible metric you mean at least now you have some basis of how that you came to that number and this metric honestly it will save you it will save you tracing a target that you're never going to hit it will save you chasing unrealistic expectations but This week I was working with a community that whose competitors um, have a have have also have communities that have around 30,000 members 50,000 members 60,000 members and they want to reach that level within a year but their competitors communities are like six or seven years old it's not realistic to get to that number within a year it just isn't so you can start setting reasonable expectations based upon these kind of things and the reason why a membership projection is important not just so um, Not just so you don't have targets that you can't hit 
it's critical when you're anticipating anticipating what platform you're going to use. It's critical when you're trying to anticipate how many staff you need. If you are if you're expecting 100,000 members that are actively engaged, it's very different from 1,000 members. So you can start allocating your resources. Take a typical um, community platform, and it varies by platforms, but most of the big ones, they will lock you into a three-year deal. What, and what that means, they also help you estimate how many members you're likely to have. I know the Debenhams on, online community here in the UK got a high, much higher estimate than what I told them they would get, but then they were stuck on that tier for years, paying more than they would ever, ever get. And, and it's kind of a, um, that's it, it's kind of a racket, really. If a vendor helps you set really high expectations and you don't hit that number, you still have to pay for the expectations they help you set. But if they set lower expectations and you surpass that number, they will simply charge you more. So it's a game that works against you, which is why it's a lot better to be conser 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 conservative and upgrade if you need to, because no vendor is going to say, hey, we don't want your money, um, than to have a higher estimate and then be stuck on that tier that you're not going to... Um, that you're not going to get. So have a reasonable projection that you can work with and having a simple tool like I have here or using your own or whatever works for you, just work with something that's defensible. Great. Listen, Richard, I could talk for you for hours and, and it's, it's I have so time. <laughs> we have a bit of time, not, not enough as much as we want. And there's a great question uh, from your friend, uh, Jimmy, right? I pronounced it correctly. And... Um, Den Bouchard, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, beautiful. Um, how do you recommend we stay competitive against other support channels like live chat if gamification isn't the solution? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's kind of awkward giving like a suggestions to a form to a former client in a, in a webinar because um, I should have made those, those suggestions at the time, right? Um, <laughs> Maybe they need I, to rehire you, mate. <laughs> um. How do you say? I think the challenge, I'll talk, I'll talk in generic terms because I think I have an, an NDA with this client, so I've got to be a bit careful. Um, I think the challenge facing a lot of organizations is that they haven't properly positioned where the community fits in to the bigger structure of what they're doing. So if you're a customer and you want a response that's personalized to you, uh, that's quite quick, then if you can just phone customer support, instead of uh, using a community, then you will use support because it's faster and it's quicker. So you have to think about what is the exact positioning of the community against the other channels that are out there today. So if um, some people want to use live chat instead, what does the community do that live chat doesn't? And if you can't think of a reason for that, then community sh shouldn't, shouldn't be there, right? I mean, but I think in this particular example, there definitely is a very strong use case for that community. But you have to think about what can a live chat do and what can it can't. Um, so there are two types of live, of live chats. There's the, or, there's the automated one where a bot will respond, which is quite basic and guide you through a self-diagnosis, but it can't do much beyond that. And then there's virtual a agents as well. And a community has a couple of advantages against virtual agents. One is that virtual a agents cost more. People will ask the same questions over and over again and they can find those answers in a community instead of contacting that agent. Um, so it makes more sense. Even if you're not seeing it, a lot of people are probably looking at the answers in that, commu that community and not having to contact a virtual agent in the first place. The second thing is to think about co convenience or speed or quality. Think about what is the thing that makes a community better than um, live chat? What is the thing that makes it better? What is the thing that live chat can't, can't do that members care a lot about? Um, if um, if you look at like the interview transcripts we've done, we try to source this kind of information and figure out what do people really, really want? So it's a really good question, but I think the challenge is the positioning of that community and how you communicate that and what the user flow is like. This ties into another thing actually, is where does the community fit into that journey? Is the community the first place that people go to? So it filters out a lot of the questions and only leaves the more difficult questions for customer support reps. Or is community the catch-all of, of uh, questions that haven't been solved by the other channels? And you have to figure out where the community belongs in there, because once you figure that out, you can position your community um, accordingly as well. So I don't have a direct un un answer for Jen, because I think you need to do the research. You have to think, figure out, is it speed? Is it convenience? Is it quality of response? Is it targeting a particular niche? Um, 
but yeah, we can talk about after this um, session if you like, Jen. And I think maybe you guys need to reconnect to, to uh, Richard. <laughs> so before we close, I want to thank Richard. Um, I want to share a link to his uh, newest book, um, Building Your Community, right? Um, Build Your Community. Build yeah. Community. Oh, you shared the link already. I, I got ahead of you. Great. <laughs> Building Your Community. Uh, Build Your Community. And I think one of the most in interesting and important things I believe you should take from Richard is the balance between, you know, um, having a methodology in research and learning, which I feel that is not done enough in the world of community many times because of, you know, the, the people around you, if you're part of a brand or a, or a business, like, come on, I want to see results and I want to see results. And then you don't invest enough time in understanding your crowd and learning. And we as ISCL, and when we help customers, we always break it down to three parts. And we say, you have to create a strategic analysis before. And we don't mm -hmm. work with any and say, okay, so give me what you would do. And then, you know, say, no, that's the thing, you know, and you need to pay for it. You need to pay because if you want to have good, good analysis, you have to do a research. And, then that, and I think that's maybe the biggest lack of understanding the world of community, that in order to build a great community and... I sinned a bit in, in doing these kind of questions of doing very general questions because many times I want to help my crowd <laughs> have general answers. But um, that's the thing with a webinar. You can't, like, it's it's not a one-on-one -on -one session. Like, choosing a... a you know, you know what, let me jump in. It blows my mind how many people are building or managing or launching communities today without interviewing the people or speaking to the people that they're building a community for. It absolutely blows my mind. I've literally been in situations where I've sat with members of the audience um, that we were like literally in a cafe and seeing how they navigate around the website, seeing how they navigate through their day, really had them keep, um, keep even a, di a, a diary at times. So I can understand exactly where the community could be useful in uh, what they do. And when communities do go wrong or they're not successful, it's usually when the people um, managing those communities haven't spent enough time with the audience. They're not accepted by the audience. They don't truly understand the topic. Um, and that's a challenge that is, it, it's a solvable one. Um, but I don't feel that message, like you're saying, it, people aren't doing enough research. And so they, they think that they're saving time, but it's just time that they spend later on down the road. It's, it's more than not just saving time. It's like the same in, in many times mm. the mistake of just having a lot of information. And, P and you said that today, the main reason that people join communities we, in, the in the utility model, what we understand is a lot of utilities where you are a part of a community, but you need to break it down to two parts. Why you join a community, which is usually a very rational need. Information, a network, uh, a status reason, like I want to be part of this exclusive community. Like you said, when you want to start a new community, having a, like a status building a, a position for community, that's great. And also um, resources, like, okay, if you join this community, you have access to this, this, and this, and this. So these are the first reasons people join. And the belonging and all the rest of the things are the people, why people stay within a community. But what I'm trying to say is what you need is actually investing, if you talk about the utility of information, good information isn't a lot of information. Good information is focused mm -hmm. information that people know what they're getting and they know that it's... Um, checked or managed or organized in some kind of way so when you say it's a good thing to have a community and start people come for information it means it needs to be quality information managed information organized information and, and yeah absolutely so that's and, investing in focusing instead of and, and and redoing the thing instead of adding more or doing try to be better instead of instead of doing more trying to do better and that, that i think is the main message i would look at and that ties into something else that we're spending more and more of our time doing, which is instead of adding more features and more discussions and more activity to a community, which is removing and archiving things that are no longer useful to members, making the experience of visiting that community easier. Because if let's say I visit a community and I search for and I ask a question and there's seven different responses or topics about that, that's not a good experience for me. I mean, that's like seven like different different discussions, I have to read each of them, might have 10 responses, that's our like 70 posts, no more than that, like 77 posts that I have to read. Um, so it's like, it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of um, activity and it's a lot of work that I have to do. And it means then it's more, it's more convenient for me just to contact support, right? Because the community isn't the best answer. When you start removing stuff, not only does your search tra traffic tend to go up, you tend to find as much better results as a result of that as well. 
Um, yeah, so I, I fully agree. Great. Um, Richard, thank you so much for your time. I don't see we have any other questions. And also I have <laughs> screaming in the other side of the room and it's really hard to focus. <laughs> no um, worries whatsoever. I hope that your child is doing well. Yeah, he'll be fine, I'm sure. As we say in Israel, until the wedding, it will pass. <laughs> translation of a, of a common saying here. Um, guys, go and check out Richard's book. Go and see his other talks also. There's a lot to learn from this guy. And uh, I look forward to our next talk, maybe. Are you talking to this CMX Summit? Uh, no, I'm away no. this year. This year there's Seth, so now Seth is there. So, by the way, you started your internship, you started your world in community by, after your internship in, with Seth Gooden, right? Yeah, back in like 2008, I think. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, amazing. Closing a cycle. So, again, Richard, thank you so much for your time. I know you're very busy and it's a great opportunity. Um, and thank you, Roy, you can take us off. And thank you, everybody, and thank you for joining and uh, thank you, Hi Ex Hey Expert, for helping us. Um, Thanks so much, everyone. If you have any questions, just send on the group uh, and Community Pros on LinkedIn. Check out Community Pros on LinkedIn, a new group. Didn't even talk about it. Um, I think, Roy, are you with us?